Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everybody to another edition of Science Cafe uh, with the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Conservation Research Department. We're very excited to have with us tonight, all the way from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, Dr. Carolina Hayduk, who will be pre uh, presenting on variations and evolution of plant photosynthesis. Uh, before we get started, just wanna go over a few things. Uh, Everyone is currently uh, muted and your videos are off. So if you could just keep those, uh, remain muted and keep your videos off for the remainder of the presentation, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we're also gonna have a question and answer section at the end of this. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a little Q and A button there. Um, so any questions that you might have uh, throughout the talk or, or at the end of the talk, you can go ahead and direct those questions there. And then after uh, Dr. Hayduke is done presenting, we'll go ahead and start going through some of those questions. I see we got a lot of particip participants tonight, so we might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, also, I just wanna let everyone know that we are currently recording this and this will be available on our website. Uh, and I will share that link to our Science Cafe website with you all. So I think we're about ready to get started, uh, but before I, give the floor to Dr. Hayduke. I'll just give you a quick uh, introduction to who she is and what she's about. Uh, Carolina Hayduke is a plant evolutionary biologist who brings together plant physiology and genomics to understand how plant traits evolve. She received her PhD from the University of Georgia in 2015, remained there for postdoctoral work and completed a second postdoc position at Yale University as a Donnelly postdoctoral fellow at the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies. She began her position as assistant professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in January 2020, where she also serves as the director of the Joseph, Joseph F. Rock Herbarium. So hey, Dr. Hayduke, whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen there. Thank you for that you nice introduction. Oops. All right, let's go ahead. All right, can uh, somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see this or say that you can see this? <laughs> okay, awesome. Thanks so much uh, everybody for being here. I'm really excited to share with you sort of my love of plant photosynthesis today. Uh, that's what a lot of my research is on. Uh, I'm not going to get super in-depth into any of my research. I just kind of wanted to share with you my awe of the plant world uh, and the variation that we can find in plant photosynthesis. Uh, so um, one of the kind of the fun parts about being into plants, being a plant biologist, is thinking about all the diversity of habitat types, growth forms, morphological shapes, everything about plants, there's so much diversity. So this is sort of a, a stereotypical plant diversity slide, where, right? Where we show all of the interesting um, types of plants. In particular though, I wanted to focus on the habitat diversity, right? So you have plants that are growing in tropical regions. You have plants that are growing in deserts. You have plants growing in the shady uh, understory of forests. This poor little plant on the uh, big island of Hawaii uh, is growing sideways due to the really strong winds that uh, it experiences. So plant diversity in terms of habitat types, plants are experiencing all sorts of habitats and environmental conditions. But despite that fact, there's one thing that all of these plants have in common that's kind of cool. And that is, is that they all photosynthesize. So if you are thinking about plants or if you ask your friend, hey, what's one thing that unites all plants? People will probably say that plants are typically green. And then if you prod them a little bit, um, eventually they'll come around to saying, oh yeah, plants photosynthesize. So despite this variety of habitats, plants all are using this process of photosynthesis to essentially take CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it into a sugar. It's sort of this really important basis of all of our ecosystems. Uh, it's the starting point of many, many food webs. Uh, and despite that fact, what I'm gonna share today is that there's actually a lot of variation uh, in how plants accomplish this core task of photosynthesizing. Uh, 
Okay, so before we get into all the fun parts, let's just make sure we're all on the same page with what photosynthesis is. And we'll start with sort of the, the textbook version of photosynthesis. And uh, you don't need to know all of these particular things. This is a little bit of a busy graph. What I do want you to focus on is that these molecules up here are carbon dioxide, CO2. They are coming into this plant cell. Uh, and then they are being converted into sugars in the chloroplast through a variety of steps. The diagram that I'm showing you right now is what we call C3 photosynthesis. It's the most common kind of photosynthesis that plants undergo. Uh, and it involves this enzyme Rubisco uh, and this process called the Calvin cycle, where this CO2 molecule that came from the atmosphere is converted into a sugar that this plant can use for growth and function. Okay, so I mentioned Rubisco. Rubisco is kind of a problematic enzyme. It's a confused enzyme in that it can work not only with CO2, which is what plants want to be able to make those sugars. It can also unfortunately work with O2. And that's a problem because when plants fix O2 or when Rubisco interacts with oxygen, plants undergo this sort of wasteful process called photorespiration whereby they actually expend energy to get rid of oxygen from these substrates, from these various molecules, so that they can be freed up again for CO2 fixation. So the left side of this diagram is what plants want to be doing in order to fix uh, CO2 to convert it, it into sugars. And the right side is kind of the downside of Rubisco in that oxygen is sort of being wastefully used in this process. Uh, and plants have a finite amount of Rubisco, so if they're using it to fix oxygen through this wasteful process, they're not able to fix as much CO2 into these usable sugars that are super important for their growth. So photorespiration in particular increases under high temperatures, high light, um, and uh, often a lack of water. And we'll go through sort of why that happens uh, in a second here. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is water limitation and how water limitation can actually lead to photorespiration. So I'm sure all of us have accidentally drought stressed a plant in our house. When you forget to water it, it starts to look wilty. But what's actually happening there? Um, we need to take a step back first and think about why water is important for plants at all. So in plants, water is taken up through the roots, uh, travels through the shoot system and through the leaf, and it exits the leaf through these pores in the leaf called stomata. This is a really important driver of uh, water movement through plants, this evaporation of water through the stomata. It's also really important because it allows CO2 to enter that same pore, that same stomata, and be used for photosynthesis. Uh, so you can see here, here's our friend Rubisco hanging out with this CO2 molecule, getting ready to start the process to convert it into sugars. What happens when plants sense some form of drought stress is that one of the first things they want to do is actually snap, uh, close those stomata. Uh, and that's a really effective way of preventing water loss, uh, right? If the water can't exit the leaf, it gets stuck in here. And so the whole plant system preserves some of that water. Unfortunately, this mechanism of closing the stomata is also a really good way of preventing CO2 from coming into the leaf. Uh, and the CO2 is really important, right? For sugar fixation, we've um, sort of gone over that. Uh, but what happens is once Rubisco sort of uses all the CO2 that was available, it's left with oxygen in this leaf. And we just talked about how Rubisco can go through this wasteful photorespiratory pathway using oxygen. And that's essentially what happens. If the stomata stay closed long enough, Rubisco will start to sort of uselessly uh, cycle this oxygen um, through this process called photorespiration. So this is how a lack of water eventually leads to the stomata closing and a higher oxygen buildup in the leaf uh, that leads to photorespiration. Um, another component of, that promotes photorespiration that I mentioned is high temperatures. And this one's kind of a simpler explanation. It really just has to do with the enzyme Rubisco. Um, so under certain temperature conditions, Rubisco has a higher affinity for CO2, meaning it's much more likely to interact with CO2 than it is with oxygen. Under really high temperatures, though, that affinity switches, and Rubisco under these high temperatures will actually prefer working with oxygen. And so plants will undergo this sort of useless photorespiratory pathway more often when they are experiencing these high temperatures. So water limitation and high temperatures both lead to photorespiration, 
which is bad for plants because it's a useless waste of energy, essentially. Um, but uh, plants have adapted to these environments where that might promote photorespiration by evolving alternative photosynthetic pathways. Uh, and these are called C4 and CAM. And I'll go into a lot more depth about what these pathways are doing as we go on. But for now, uh, looking at this diagram, this is a phylogeny uh, of all of the vascular plant species. In other words, it's showing the relationships between these species. You don't need to know the details and the names along the sides. What I do want you to focus on is that all the places that are marked in yellow are CAM species. Uh, and all the uh, places marked in blue are C4 species. So all these colored edges up here represent plants that are using these alternative C4 and CAM pathways uh, to generate their um, sugars for growth uh, and production. Uh, and another thing to note here is that CAM uh, plants are about, represent about 8% of the total species diversity and C4 about 3%. Okay, so let's get a little bit into the details of what these pathways are doing. How exactly is C4 and CAM preventing photorespiration from happening? We'll start with C4. Um, if you recall back to when we were talking about C3 photosynthesis, everything was happening in one cell. CO2 was entering the cell, it was being converted into sugars eventually through this Calvin cycle, uh, through the use of rubisco. C4 instead splits this process into two pieces and separates it spatially in different cell types. So what happens first is that CO2 enters the cells that are called mesophyll cells, uh, where CO2 is initially converted into an organic acid. It doesn't really matter for today what that acid is, it's typically malate. Um, that malate can then be moved into an adjacent cell called a bundle sheath cell. Um, and what happens in that bundle sheath cell is sort of the reverse process that happened in the mesophyll cell. So in the mesophyll cell, these plants were taking CO2 and converting it into an organic acid. In the bundle sheath cell, they're taking that organic acid and reconverting it into CO2, which seems like a lot of steps for some reason. Uh, but what happens is that it means that there's a really high concentration of CO2 in these bundle sheath cells. Uh, and if you notice, that's where the rubisco is. So C4 plants will not have very much rubisco in the mesophyll cells, if any, and they concentrate all of it in these bundle sheath cells so that when this organic acid is reconverted into CO2, it essentially rubisco never has a chance to see oxygen because there's just so much CO2 built up and concentrated in this cell. Uh, and so the advantage here is that this is reducing photorespiration because rubisco never has that chance to interact with oxygen due to this carbon concentrating. Okay, so that maybe sounded really complicated and you might be thinking that C4 must be a wildly different phenotype. It must involve all these new things that have to evolve in plants. But actually, uh, most of the genes, all of the genes actually, that are used in C4, all of the enzymes, all of the proteins, they're found in all plants already. Uh, so now I want you to kind of just focus on what the letters are in these gray blobs. Um, these are different gene names, different enzymes. And you'll note that on the left here is the C4 pathway. On the right is the C3 that I showed you in the very first slide. Those same gray names show up on the C3 pathway too. So the same genes that are used in C4 are already sort of hanging out in C3 plants doing different functions um, and the idea is that these genes get sort of co-opted or uh, borrowed to uh, complete these C4 functions. Okay, and so here's just a sort of proof of concept of what I'm telling you about C4. Um, remember, one of the ways in which photorespiration can increase in plants is under high temperatures, and that has to do with the rubisco enzyme itself. Uh, this plot is showing you um, here on the y-axis, the net photosynthetic rate, um, so the total amount of photosynthesis that these, these two plants shown in the diagram are doing, higher means more productive. Um, on the x-axis is looking at leaf temperature, which is correlated to uh, sort of air temperature. And you can see if you focus first on this blue uh, line, which is a C3 species, so this is sort of the, the regular <laughs> photosynthetic type, um, these plants that are using C3 uh, sort of plateau in their ability to photosynthesize, uh, and then it drops off quite steeply. So you can see that photorespiration starts to kick in in these C3 species 
and their net productivity drops. Compare that to the C4 plant in the red, and you can see that it just keeps on going, right? Eventually it hits a temperature so high that enzymes and proteins sort of break apart in the cells. But until that point, C4 productivity keeps increasing. And that's because these plants have basically eliminated that photorespiration stress by concentrating all of that CO2 in those bundle sheath cells. Um, one other kind of interesting aspect about C4 photosynthesis is that it requires a pretty specific anatomy. I kind of already alluded to it when I talked about mesophyll cells and bundle sheath cells. Those are the two cell types that C4 is separating out the photosynthetic steps into. The, what I'm showing you here is uh, a leaf, a cross section of a hosta leaf. So hostas, perhaps you're familiar with them. They're often planted in people's backyards. Um, it's a C3 plant, uh, and just looking at this, these cells, um, the, the purple circles are essentially cells. You can see there's a lot of mesophyll cells. Um, here's a vascular bundle, so this is where water and sugar is transported, uh, kind of like the veins of the plant. Uh, and then surrounding it are these bundle sheath cells. So all plants have these bundle sheath cells, but in this hosta C3 species, they're kind of mediocre, tepid. If you compare that to a C4 leaf, uh, you still have the same uh, cell types. There's still mesophyll cells. Now you can see these bundle sheath cells are humongous. And the distance between a, a one bundle sheath cell and the next bundle sheath cell is greatly reduced. So C4 plants have this unique anatomy that we call Kranz anatomy that consists of really large bundle sheath cells. And that allows them to, uh, de uh, to generate a whole lot of CO2 in those cells. Um, and a small distance between uh, adjacent ones, meaning that for every mesophyll cell where CO2 initially comes in, there's a nearby bundle sheath cell that can actually start that process of converting it into a sugar. Okay, and so just really briefly, where, uh, when did C4 photosynthesis evolve? Um, it turns out that we think it evolved um, about 20 million years ago. Um, coinciding essentially with a drop in CO2 levels. So this diagram uh, in red is showing you the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and in gray, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So oxygen is more or less stable, except with recent declines. Um, CO2, you can see had this really sharp drop here um, where the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere rapidly declined. And shortly after you see the evolution of C4 photosynthesis. And that makes sense, right? So uh, if the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere drops, Rubisco suddenly is going to experience much more photorespiration because the amount of oxygen relative to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up. There's way more oxygen per molecule of CO2. And so that sort of created the selection pressure for C4 photosynthesis to evolve. Um, it also coincided with the uh, sort of aridification of a lot of these habitats. Uh, so when we think of C4 plants, they are things like grasses, um, some tropical grasses, corn is a C4 plant, sugarcane is a C4 plant. They grow in these really high light open environments that started to appear on earth when this aridification event happened um, about 10 to 15 million years ago. Okay, and then I, I included this slide because this is a slide that I show to my students when I'm teaching in Hawaii, um, is that uh, the discovery of C4 photosynthesis has a history in Hawaii. Um, this fellow named Hugo, um, Hugo Kortschak, was a uh, researcher with the, um, uh, the Sugar uh, Planters Association in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, this was in the mid 1900s. Um, he and another um, collaborator were using the heavy isotope of carbon um, to trace where photosynthesis was putting uh, carbons. So what this means is you can use um, carbon comes in multiple isotopes. C12 is sort of the standard one. If you can use a heavier one, C14, you can actually detect that molecule um, in different products in plants. So what they did is they fed plants this heavier labeled C14 isotope and could then measure different products um, in the plant to see where that C14 was going. And what they noticed is that it was going into this malic acid. Remember from earlier, we talked about how malate was contributing to, uh, was part of C4 photosynthesis. And so they saw that this, this heavier labeled 
uh, carbon was actually going into a very different kind of metabolite than what was happening in C3 photosynthesis. Unfortunately, they, uh, their paper didn't get a lot of attention, uh, and the folks who get most of the credit for discovering C4 photosynthesis, Hatch and Slack, published a paper about a year later and are largely credited with the discovery. Okay, uh, I want to step back from C4 now and talk about a, the type of photosynthesis that my research is actually on, which is CAM photosynthesis. But before I do that, I wanted to mention again, uh, or remind you rather about water limitations inhibiting CO2 accumulation. So I showed you this diagram earlier where this exchange of water for CO2 through these stomata in the leaf are really important for maintaining photosynthetic um, efficiency or productivity. And that when plants get drought stress, they shut the stomata to prevent water loss, but also that inhibits CO2 from coming into the plant. And so for plants that experience water loss every once in a while or for short periods of time, this might not be very problematic, um, but for plants that maybe live in a desert or experience really long droughts, this is going to start to starve the plant of CO2. Uh, and so to avoid this starvation, um, what has evolved is known as crash dilation acid metabolism or CAM photosynthesis for short. Uh, and in a lot of ways, CAM is very similar to C4, except instead of spatially separating the parts of the photosynthetic pathway into two different cell types, CAM plants temporally separate it. So what does that mean? It means that in CAM plants, their stomata are actually open at night. Uh, CO2 comes into the cells uh, at night and is still converted into malic acid, just like it was in C4 plants, except now that acid is stored in this um, uh, part of the cell called the vacuole, which is really just like this large space for plants to store stuff in their cells. During the day, the stomata will close up. That malic acid is moved back into the cell uh, and is reconverted back into CO2, just like it was in C4. And now this cell has really high levels of CO2 uh, surrounding rubisco. So rubisco is happy. It's not experiencing or it's not encountering any oxygen. It's kind of chugging along with all of this carbon dioxide that floods the cell during the day. Uh, by closing the stomata, the camp plants prevent the CO2 from escaping back out into the atmosphere, which is great. It also prevents water from escaping into the atmosphere, often during the hottest or driest part of the day. Uh, and so this is kind of like when you exercise. If you exercise at night when it's cooler, you're going to sweat a lot less. If you exercise during the day, the hottest part of the day, you're going to sweat buckets, right? And that's kind of the same thing that these plants are avoiding. By closing these stomata during the hottest part of the day, they prevent water from evaporating into the atmosphere. Okay, so where is CAM? I'm showing you this diagram again. Uh, and now we're just looking at the yellow uh, here across this phylogeny. That's where these CAM species are. Uh, and I've included here some photos of CAM plants um, uh, based on my descriptions of water limitation. You can imagine that things like cacti, euphorbs, they're using CAM. They're found in really dry environments. Same over here with this agave. What's maybe a little bit less intuitive is that there are a lot of tropical plants that can use CAM as well. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit in a few slides. Uh, and some ferns potentially are using CAM too. So CAM is found um, in a greater diversity of plant groups than C4 photosynthesis and um, constitutes a larger proportion of total species than C4 photosynthesis. And I'm totally not at all biased uh, against C4. I just really like CAM. Okay, so before we get into the details of CAM, I kind of wanted to um, share with you what I think is one of the coolest parts of CAM photosynthesis is that it's really, really flexible. Um, so before I get into that though, um, I wanted to talk about the ways that we can measure CAM photosynthesis that I do personally measure CAM photosynthesis as part of my research. So if we have a C3 plant and a CAM plant, we can um, assess whether or not this plant is C3 or CAM through a number of ways. One of those ways is through measuring gas exchange. So this is literally clamping a machine onto a leaf that can measure the amount of CO2 going into the cells and the amount of water vapor leaving uh, the cells. Uh, and so if you uh, are looking at gas exchange in the C3 plant, it's all happening during the day, right? All of the photosynthesis happens during the daytime in C3. 
In camp plants though, as we just described, a large proportion of it is going to happen at night when those stomata are open. Remember, that's where the gas exchange is happening is through those stomata. Another thing we can measure is actually the accumulation of this malic acid. So in C3 plants, there's no sort of variation across the day-night cycle in terms of um, malic acid accumulation, but in a camp plant there is. Remember, they're taking that CO2 at night and storing it as this malic acid in their vacuole. And so what happens is if you track the amount of malic acid in these leaves, it will increase over the night period and then decrease uh, during the day as it's reconverted back into C3. What I think is really cool is that in between these two extremes of C3 and CAM are a whole variety of phenotypes that we call C3 plus CAM. These are plants that can use both photosynthetic pathways, C3 and CAM, in a single individual. So they might look something like this if we we're measuring the same sort of traits. Their gas exchange might be mostly like C3, but have a little bit of indication of CAM. And they might have lower levels of malic acid accumulation, but a still a significant variation across the day-night cycle. Another cool um, intermediate phenotype is called facultative CAM. This is where plants under well-watered conditions will look like a C3 plant. They have all of the water they need to function and they're hanging out in the C3 photosynthetic mode. When you drought stress them, they will actually turn on CAM and sort of turn down C3 photosynthesis. So this is sort of a super flexible way of coping with drought stress. They sense the drought and they say, whoa, whoa, we got to turn on this water saving CAM pathway. And they do that. They, they will upregulate nighttime CO2 uptake. They will start having um, malic acid accumulation. And typically when you rewater these plants, they'll go back to the original uh, C3 state. So CAM is really cool um, and in many ways cooler than C4 because it's so flexible. You don't really see this amount of intermediate phenotypes in the C4 um, photosynthesis plants. Um, not to the same degree as you see in CAM plants. So just like we talked about with C4 anatomy being specific, it was this Kranz anatomy, there's certain anatomical traits that we think are important for CAM plants as well. So one of those is really densely packed together cells. Um, and that's a way of essentially preventing CO2 from leaking back out into the atmosphere. If you remember in the daytime, these cells are releasing a bunch of CO2 uh, to surround rubisco, if there's a lot of space in between the cells, that CO2 can actually kind of leak out and go back into the atmosphere and essentially negating a lot of the hard work that the CAM plant put in to generating all of that CO2 in the first place. The other trait that uh, we often associate with CAM in terms of their leaf anatomy is a really large vacuole. So remember, this is where, C or where CAM plants are storing all of that malic acid. So the bigger the vacuole, the more CAM a plant can do. And that often corresponds with a really large cell as well. So what does this look like in, uh, in, uh, in reality? Here's a C3 plant uh, cross section. Again, the, the blue circles here are individual cells. You can see there's a lot of this airspace where there's no cell um, density. And you don't really have a good sense of the cell size until I show you the CAM species alongside it. This is taken at the exact same magnification as this one. You can see now that the cells are way huge, way bigger than they are in the C3 plant. And generally there's a lot less airspace between those cells. So this CAM plant, uh, this agave is a really good example of what we think are these sort of typical uh, CAM anatomies, really densely packed together cells, often associated with a succulent leaf um, and these large cells as well. Okay, um, and I want to kind of bring it back to the, I tease you with these tropical plants that aren't uh, necessarily C3, but they're using CAM and that you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, you told me that CAM was good for uh, plants that experience water limitation, some kind of drought stress. A lot of the tropical species that use CAM photosynthesis are um, often epiphytes, meaning they grow um, using the support of other plants and don't actually have roots in the soil. And you can imagine if you're a plant hanging out on a tree limb, your water um, availability is largely dictated by what's in the atmosphere or maybe what rains, right? There's no ability to tap into any water sources in the soil. So a lot of these epiphytic plants are actually water limited and can use CAM. Other tropical species may sometimes be found in seasonally dry forests um, in the tropics where there might be a rainy season, but then a prolonged sort of dry season. And that those species also have been found to use CAM.
So I should mention a lot of orchids use CAM. Uh, this is a pineapple field here on Oahu. Pineapple is a CAM species. A lot of the other plants um, in this family, Bromeliaceae, are also CAM, despite being tropical um, in origin. So CAM is not only a very flexible trait, but it's also a really diverse trait and is found in a wide variety of lineages. Perhaps the best example of this flexibility of how of where CAM is found is that it can also be found in aquatic or semi-aquatic species. So this is uh, Isoides. Um, it's not even it's not a flowering plant, uh, but it is uh, found in these sort of ephemeral uh, or sometimes permanent ponds. Um, and it actually is using CAM. So this plant growing in water is using CAM. And why would that be? So it is experiencing photorespiratory stress in a slightly different way. Uh, in the daytime, so this graph is showing the amount of free CO2 um, in this black line. So the amount of CO2 that's available in the pond uh, at night and during the day. And you can see that this black line increases at night and then sharply drops off during the day. And that's largely because other plants uh, are using up that CO2. Um, and so during the day, there's a steep decline in the availability of CO2. So this Isoides has essentially taken advantage of the fact that there's a high amount of CO2 available at night and has evolved CAM photosynthesis to sort of take advantage of that. So they're conducting their um, CO2 uptake or photosynthesis at night when there's lots and lots of CO2 available for these plants uh, in these systems. And what's cool about some of these plants is that when they're underwater, uh, the Isoides species will be using CAM. And then if they are above water uh, or emerging from the water, they'll actually go back to using C3. So this is kind of like the facultative species that I talked about earlier, but now um, in this really nifty aquatic system. Okay, and just like I mentioned briefly how C4 was discovered, uh, CAM was actually discovered uh, much longer ago than C4, although the sort of the details of how CAM was working are more recent. But um, way back, as far back as 1682, this um, British botanist named Grew uh, described an acidic taste of aloe. Uh, and subsequent people also described um, that not only was there an acidic taste, but that it was increasing in the morning. So if you, <laughs> if you tasted a plant in the morning, it was more acidic than if you tasted that same plant uh, in the evening. Uh, and if you recall what we were talking about with malic acid accumulation, there, these folks who are eating these plants are essentially tasting the buildup of malic acid over the night period and then the drop of acid during the day. And I have to include this disclaimer, please do not go eating strange plants in an effort to find CAM. There are much better ways to do this now. Uh, so please don't go around telling people that I told you to eat plants to find out if they're CAM. Okay, so I wanted to end with a few slides that specifically talk about the research that I'm doing in uh, my new lab. Um, and I have sort of two main questions, I think, when it comes to CAM photosynthesis. Uh, the first one is how does it evolve? Um, what are the series of events that lead to CAM? Uh, and which genes specifically are important and how do they get incorporated into the CAM pathway. So I'm interested in sort of this macro scale where I'm interested in understanding how the CAM uh, pathway is put together over long periods of time. And then I'm also interested in getting into sort of the details about uh, which genes are used, how they are used, um, and the changes associated with those genes as they get incorporated into CAM. Uh, and my lab uses a variety of different approaches. We do everything from macroevolution, studying long periods of time, um, populations and adaptation, physiology, anatomy, and then genetics and genomics as well. Uh, most of my work is in this lovely family, uh, the Asparagaceae, and in particular, I work in the subfamily Agavoidae, which includes agaves, yuccas, the Joshua tree is also a yucca, and this family, uh, this subfamily is really great for studying CAM photosynthesis uh, because not only are there these desert species, the agaves and yuccas, but there's also a number of really uh, of species that really like wet conditions. So hosta, um, this is a camasia. So this sets up a really nice sort of comparison between these plants that live in really dry habitats and these plants that live in wetter habitats. Um, the agavoidae is also a really great system for studying CAM because CAM has evolved independently in this group of plants three times. Uh, 
Um, it's not important what the genera here are, but um, the yellow circles indicate where CAM has evolved. So one here in this genus called Hesperallo, one here in some of the species of yucca, and then once probably here in this larger group that we'll refer to as agave sensulata. So this is also really convenient if we're trying to understand how CAM evolves because it gives us sort of this independent replication, right? We can compare whether or not CAM evolved the same way in this group up here to yucca and to hesperalo. Uh, and so like I mentioned, we do a lot of physiology work. Here's um, some gas exchange. So this is looking at photosynthesis in a C3 plant and a CAM plant. Um, I often will do experiments where I keep plants well watered, showing in blue. I'll measure how much photosynthesis they're doing. So this top panel is showing the C3 plant uh, photosynthesizing during the day, and then its stomata are closed at night. And the same thing happens at drought. I basically droughted it enough that it closed its stomata entirely. Compare that to this CAM species on the bottom where you can actually see nighttime CO2 uptake. It's one of my favorite things to measure is to clamp this fancy machine onto a new plant and see that it's actually photosynthesizing at night. It, it never gets old. Uh, and the other thing we measure is that amount of malic acid accumulation. So you can see the C3 plant has no accumulation. It's zero acid, both during the well watered and drought stress conditions. Uh, but the CAM plant has significant levels of this acid accumulation. Uh, another aspect, large aspect of my work is looking at uh, genomes and genetics. Uh, so we do a lot of work uh, in what we term comparative genomics, where we sequence and analyze the genomes of closely related species that differ in a key trait, in this case, photosynthetic pathway, and then use that close comparison to be able to understand what, what parts of the genome are different and whether or not that's associated with the trait of interest. Uh, so one of the questions uh, my lab asks is whether or not CAM evolves the same way each time, and this is using these independent origins um, of CAM uh, in these different genera. And in particular, I'll show you an example here of asking whether or not the anatomy is the same each time CAM evolves. We generally think that um, the same similar traits are required, these larger cells, the cells that are densely packed together, but there can be some variation in that, and it turns out that there is. So these are three leaf cross sections of the three different uh, genera that evolved CAM independently. This is work that an undergraduate uh, researcher helped me with here at the University of Hawaii. She has since graduated, sadly, but um, while she was with me, she was analyzing the sort of the detailed leaf anatomy of these different origins of CAM. And there are pretty big differences. Even just looking at these leaves, you can see that the structure, the shape of these leaves is really quite different, um, indicating that each origin of CAM essentially has kind of tinkered with the anatomy a little bit differently um, each time it evolved. Uh, I also work a lot in this genus Yucca, and in particular, I work on species of Yucca that are native to the southeastern United States. Uh, I study Yucca filamentosa, uh, which is actually pretty broadly dispersed across the eastern United States, and Yucca alifolia, which is more limited to the southeastern US. Um, and uh, the important thing here is that these two species use different photosynthetic types. Uh, so Yucca filamentosa is C3. These are, again, the amount of CO2 these plants are taking up. So this blue species, the C3 species, only takes up CO2 during the day, so C3 species. The CAM species, on the other hand, uh, has nighttime CO2 uptake under both well-watered and drought stress conditions. So this is kind of what I was talking about with the comparative genomics, is that you have these closely related species that differ in a, this trait of interest. And then you can start to ask questions about uh, what changes are required at a genetic level uh, for these, these traits to evolve. And that's essentially what we do. One aspect of my work is looking at gene expression. So we can measure how much of a gene is expressed in a plant uh, and sort of make some inferences about um, whether or not it's functional and how it might be functional. Uh, so I didn't talk about this gene in detail, but this, the gene I'm showing you expression data for is a super important gene for CAM photosynthesis. I'm showing you expression data well watered uh, conditions in blue and the drought stress conditions in red, day and night samples. And you can see there's really high expression of this gene in the CAM yucca species that I've already mentioned. So this is kind of what we would expect to see. There's this uh, really strong increase in expression. Uh, and it's even more notable when you compare it to the C3 yucca has really low levels of expression. So part of my research is looking through all of the genes that are expressed in these two species and comparing the magnitude of that expression 
to start to create associations with gene expression to the phenotype. So does this gene have anything to do with CAM photosynthesis? Uh, and finally, the last part of my research I'll just briefly mention is that these two species I've mentioned, Yucca alifolia and filamentosa, actually have a hybrid species, Yucca gloriosa. It's this cute little yucca that grows just in the sand dunes of the southeastern US. Um, and what's really cool about this hybrid is that it uses both pathways. So thinking back to the um, earlier slides where we talked about C3 plus CAM and facultative CAM, Yucca gloriosa is a C3 plus CAM plant. So I've added it here to the same plot in teal. You can see under well water conditions, it has a lot of CO2 uptake during the day and a little bit at night. And then when you drought stress it, it reverts to only using CAM at night. So this is both a C3 plus CAM and maybe a little bit facultative in that it can upregulate CAM photosynthesis when it's drought stressed. And that's um, a really powerful system because it allows us to look at variation in the hybrid and ask all sorts of questions. We can ask questions about the genetics and we can ask questions about anatomy. Uh, so for example, uh, here's sort of what happened in the formation of the species. The C3 uh, plant hybridized with this CAM plant. They have these very different leaf anatomies uh, and it created this C3 plus CAM hybrid. And so now we can ask whether or not certain traits that we think are really important for CAM are strictly correlated. So in all individuals, as you increase, for example, leaf thickness, do you also see an increase in cell size? That might say that there's something genetically um, uh, about these two traits that links them together. That if you have thick, thick leaves as a plant, your genetics also says you have large cells. Um, alternatively, you might have uncorrelated traits, meaning there's no predictive value of one trait on another. Uh, and it means these sort of results can have really big implications on how these traits evolve, how CAM anatomy might be evolving um, uh, each time that CAM evolves. Okay, so I think I'm a little bit just at my target time, actually. Um, so I just want to end you with sort of um, the key takeaways, I guess. Um, I hope you got from this talk that photosynthesis is a really diverse and dynamic process. I think often we think plants photosynthesize, period. And that's it, right? There's no, there's nothing else. There's no um, flavors of it, but that's actually not true. And now hopefully you'll have fun um, talking points at parties when we can resume having in-person parties where you can tell everybody about how photosynthesis is actually super diverse and dynamic and how plants have, can use variety of types of photosynthesis to accomplish their goal of creating energy uh, uh, into sugars. Uh, and so I also talked about C4 photosynthesis. These are plants that are adapted to high light and high temperature. Uh, most of the C4 plants that we know of are grasses. Um, CAM is an alternative strategy. It's well suited for areas where uh, plants might experience limited water including tropical species, or uh, it could be plants that are limited by um, CO2. So like we talked about with the Isoides species. Uh, and it really, we know that plants are super important members of our ecosystems. They can often be very foundational, uh, sort of the bottom of the food web in a lot of situations. And their ability to photosynthesize is absolutely incredible. We should never take that for granted. It sustains life on earth. It feeds us, it feeds lots of other organisms on the planet. And so understanding really how remarkable photosynthesis is, how diverse it is, uh, is really something that brings me a lot of joy. And hopefully I could briefly bring you some of that joy today as well. Um, so with that, I just wanna throw up my acknowledgement slide. Uh, and I think I have left plenty of time for questions, should there be any. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you, Dr. Hey, dude, that was awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, yeah. Um, that was a wonderful kind of rundown of, <laughs> of all those different photosynthetic pathways and what you're up to and it was, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It was really fun to put together. Uh, so we've already got a bunch of questions. So I can, uh, I can start uh, getting rolling on them. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Looks like this one is from uh, 
Marcos Pinto, who asked, uh, if the process helps fight photorespiration, why hasn't it taken over yet? That's a great question. Uh, so I think what you're getting at is that, you know, I just talked a big game about C4 and CAM plants being so amazing. If they're so amazing, why aren't all plants using C4 or CAM? Uh, the answer is actually, is that those processes require a bit more energy for the plants to do. Uh, so I kind of glossed over that, but they require literally more energy molecules to do the whole C4 process and even more energy to do the whole CAM process. So um, essentially what it comes down to is sort of a trade-off. Are you stressed enough as a plant to warrant this extra energy expenditure? Or can you kind of just get by with C3 photosynthesis? And that has a lot to do with how stressful the habitat type is. All right. Um, we have a question from Megan Luckett, who asks, has CAM or CAM-like photosynthesis evolved at different points? in geological time in groups that might have gone extinct. It seems like keeping the stomates open at night is a no-brainer for plants in general. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the beginning part of that question is um, thinking when I, you know, I talked about when C4 evolved, the story with CAM is a little bit murkier, I would say. Um, and that has a lot to do with some um, CAM being found in groups of plants that we know their ancestor has been all around for a much longer time. So for example, some cycads can use CAM and their ancestor was around way um, earlier than um, flowering plants. Um, so we, we're not actually quite sure um, when CAM has evolved. A lot of the current species we think evolved CAM more recently around the same times that C4 did. Um, and again, it has to do with the sort of the the coincident drop in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, along with the drying out of habitats that opened up these new habitats for camp plants to evolve. Um, but generally, yeah, we're, we're a little bit less certain just because CAM is found in so many more diverse lineages of plants. Um, we have a question from Corey uh, Panyard who asks, can you tell a CAM plant by looking at it? <laughs> I wish that would make my job so much easier. <laughs> um, so sort of, um, if you see a succulent plant, meaning it's got, you know, those juicy leaves or thick leaves, there's a pretty good chance it's using some amount of CAM. The downside is, is that it's almost impossible to tell if a plant is C3 plus CAM or intermediate just by looking at it. Um, you have to do all sorts of super time consuming tests like drought stressing it to actually verify that it's using CAM. Um, nowadays, uh, we have a better sense of what groups of plants might be more likely to be using CAM just because we've been doing more research. So if you stumble across something in the Orchidaceae uh, or in the orchid family and you know what species it's related to, you can kind of make educated inferences about the likelihood that it's CAM. But unfortunately, it still requires quite a bit of physiology to verify. All right, so we have a question from Mark Merlin. Uh, who says, I'm sort of surprised how recent the CAM C4 innovation is. Given how long I imagine photosynthesis has been around, has CO2 concentration been predictably high all the time? Is there any evidence that these kinds of innovations occurred earlier in evolutionary history? Yeah, um, it is a good question. And I, my answer is probably there's not much evidence that, um, that these photosynthetic pathways in plants have been around for much longer than what I sort of described. Um, and that's largely based, at, it's largely based on um, looking for the signatures of C4 or CAM uh, in the isotope record. So you can kind of tell apart things that ate C3 plants from those that ate C4 or CAM plants based on the um, different amounts of different carbon isotopes that they contain. So we only see the signature of C4 isotopes happening around 20 million years ago. That doesn't mean it didn't happen before. Our sampling is sort of imperfect sometimes. Um, but uh, generally before that period, it's thought that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was high enough that it probably didn't necessitate uh, C4 or CAM evolving, or at least evolving to the large extent that it has today. 
This question also often triggers questions about how these plants will do in the future, right? If, um, if sadly our CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere keep rising, is there a possibility that C4 and CAM basically become obsolete? They're no longer required. My answer to that, nobody really asked me this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. <laughs> My answer to that is that um, I think there will still be um, sort of these uh, environmental pressures for C4 and CAM. It's not just the CO2 that's increasing. It's also things like um, increasing aridity or drought in certain regions. There's increasing variability in rainfall. So we kind of have to take into account all these climatic and environmental factors when trying to predict how any plant will do in the future, and especially things like C4 and CAM. Oh, I did see somebody actually ask that in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> in the Q&A. Okay, let's see here. Um, this is a summarized question. Uh, have these different diverse uh, photosynthetic pathways evolved in al algae or uh, cyanobacteria? Yeah, um, so they're not quite called the same thing, but there are some algae that have, um, Oh, now I'm concerned it's not algae and maybe it is cyanobacteria. I think it's an algae that have a, what we call a carbon concentrating mechanism, but it's not quite C4 or CAM. So they're kind of doing the same thing. Um, and it's probably driven by the same reasons that something like Isoides is using CAM is that there's some um, limitation to the diffusion of CO2 in water. So there are definitely some uh, um, non-land plant um, organisms that can use a carbon concentrating mechanism. Yeah. Got a, another question here from uh, Helen Perry who asked, do you expect uh, more CAM evolution as climate change progresses? Yeah, so I, I kind of touched on this. Um, my guess is that CAM plants will continue to be um, important in regions where uh, there's decreasing rainfall. So um, lots of, of the desert Southwest, for example, parts of that region are getting drier and drier every year. This year, they're having a historic drought, for example. So even as CO2 levels might be rising and sort of minimizing photorespiratory stress in plants, there's still this temperature and drought aspect that needs to be considered. Um, there's also um, a movement to move towards producing um, biofuels from some CAM plants. So things like agave that can be grown on some of these marginal lands, lands that aren't used for high productivity agriculture, um, can instead be planted in things like agave or some species of cactus to actually provide sort of the, the starting material for biofuels as well. So uh, speaking of agriculture, we have a question from uh, an anonymous participant. Uh, they say, in the future, can farm crops be genetically modified to have uh, a different process? Yeah, so there is actually, there were two large research projects focusing on just this question. One of them is still ongoing. It's called the C4 Rice Project. Um, it's funded partially or maybe entirely by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation huge worldwide effort to essentially genetically engineer um, rice to be C4 uh, to allow it to basically increase productivity under maybe increasing temperatures is the big stress there. Um, it turns out it's really hard because C4 requires that very specific anatomy. And that's actually been the, the hardest part is getting that anatomy into rice. Um, so rice isn't a C4 plant and it doesn't have that cranth anatomy and getting the genes in place to, to sort of create that anatomy in rice is tricky. Um, there was also a project funded a few years ago now, it's no longer funded, that was trying to get um, poplar trees to, to have some aspects of cam. Poplar is used for biofuel production as well. It's this very fast growing species, but likewise is probably threatened quite a bit by drought. Um, and so the idea was to sort of put parts of the CAM pathway into these poplar trees to get them to be more drought resistant. Uh, and I think that's, that's definitely a, a, a consideration for the future is I don't think we'll be able to make something like, um, you know, pumpkin or pick your favorite crop. I don't know why I chose pumpkin, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, wheat or um, cotton. It's probably not gonna transition to being full CAM. I already told you how those uh, plants often require more energy. 
a lot of CAM species are quite slow growing because of that. Um, so what I think is more realistic is that we try to get these plants to be um, this intermediate or facultative CAM, where we, we genetically engineer them to, to a point where when they sense drought stress, they can basically turn on CAM to get them through that drought period. And then when they receive rainfall or irrigation, they can close down the CAM pathway and save energy and resume this more productive C3 pathway. So I think there's a lot of possibility for this in the future, but we're still um, quite a bit of ways for that from that. Uh, this is a question that was summarized for me. Uh, why are there so few CAM species? Did many CAM plants go extinct? It seems that CAM and C4 pathways are highly advantageous to some plants. So why isn't it more common in the plant kingdom? Yeah, so uh, it's, uh, I think the CAM pathway is found in about 8% of plants, which might sound like very few, but it's actually, I, I don't think I mentioned this, it's evolved independently probably about a hundred times. So it's cropped up on its own lots and lots of times independently in plant groups. The same for C4, it's about a hundred times independently. Um, and uh, scientists actually think that, you know, uh, a trait occurring in 8% of plants is actually kind of a large amount, but I see what you mean is that the vast majority of species are not using C4 or CAM. And I think it has all to do with this energy um, issue. So if you're a plant and you're growing in a scenario uh, where you're well watered and generally happy, there's no real reason to uh, use extra energy to do C4 or CAM photosynthesis. And in fact, when scientists have done the studies to measure productivity of these different plant types, C4 and CAM only do better under stressful conditions. Uh, if you are just looking at a sort of a happy uh, irrigated crop or a happy wet environment, um, the C3 plant way outcompetes the other two photosynthetic types. So it's really specific to this envi environment interaction um, that uh, sort of, uh, you know, selects for this C4 and CAM photosynthesis. Okay, so we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. They say, do you know of any large scale resources that contain a comprehensive list of photosynthetic pathways used by various plant genera slash species? Is there work being done to compile this information? Um, there are definitely papers uh, that have done that work of compiling. Um, I don't know the citation off the top of my head, but I could happily provide that um, to Ian or to whoever. Um, so yeah, the scientists are definitely interested in that. There's a little bit um, more known for C4, I think. Um, and that has to do with CAM plants being kind of hard to find, especially because a lot of plants will be the C3 plus CAM. And you can't detect that at all unless you experimentally drought stress the plant or sample it multiple times throughout the year through the dry season and the wet season. Uh, so CAM is actually kind of hard to find and we're probably really underestimating the number of CAM plants that exist. Um, but yeah, there are definitely um, existing sort of lists of genera. I actually think Wikipedia has probably a pretty good starting place for this list. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, but um, a number of folks, myself included, continue to sort of, um, uh, you know, search plant space to try to find uh, new instances of C4 and CAM photosynthesis. They're definitely out there, but please don't eat plants to find them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, HD says, Dr. Hayduke's explanation of photosynthesis was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then they asked, does Dr. Hayduke have any tips on how to optimize hydration and photosynthesis in houseplants? <laughs> That's a hard question. This is the thing that always, that botanists always get asked, right? Like my mom will be like, how do I take care of this? I don't know. Um, but it's pretty plant specific, right? So um, a lot of things like succulents, for example, people will crazy overwater them. Um, and that's what actually ends up killing them is that they get root rot and die. Um, so you kind of have to think about the plant, like what is it doing? This succulent plant is actually storing its water. So you don't need to water it all the time. You can water it once a week and that's how it gets by. Um, but it probably wants high light. Whereas something like a philodendron or something can just take up all the water you give it and grow, you know, berserk in your house. Um, so it's uh, unfortunately pretty plant specific, but if you um, 
uh, I doubt you'll have a C4 houseplant, but you'll definitely have CAM houseplants if you have cacti or if you're into succulents. Just remember that they're storing water. Uh, their whole deal is that they're uh, really good water savers, so don't overwater them is my tip. <laughs> Tough one to answer, but yeah, you did a great job. What, uh, so Angel Rivera asks, uh, would you be able to use genomic data as a marker for CO2 increase in the environment? Interesting. So um, I think what this question is getting at is maybe uh, looking to see if there's some kind of um, signature in the genomes of plants that indicates CO2 increasing over time. Um, there are, um, the answer is no, not at the moment. There's not like a clear gene or marker that we can use. Um, but we could probably start to be thinking about um, uh, changes in Rubisco. Um, so there are, I kind of discarded Rubisco as this terrible enzyme, but actually it does evolve um, a little bit. So different plants can tinker with the enzyme a little bit to make it have better affinities under certain conditions. So I think looking at the sort of the, the changes in the gene sequences of genes that we know are involved in CO2 um, fixation, whether it's Rubisco or the genes involved in C4 and CAM, and see how that changes across lineages might be, might sort of get at what you're um, thinking about is, do we see changes associated with uh, environmental changes uh, over deeper time? And then can we use that maybe going forward as markers too? It's a good question though. I think we're getting getting about seven o'clock there, and you answered a whole lot of questions, Dr. <laughs> Hayduke. So thanks, thanks for all the good questions. Those are fun. Yeah, sticking on and answering some of those for folks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, sorry. Let's see, share screen. Here we go. That guy. Just have a in slide there to share with folks. Um, and it does have the link there. So if you all wanna, if you had friends that weren't able to attend tonight um, and would like to, to watch this later, um, just go ahead and follow that link there at the top. And that goes to our Science Cafe website. We should have this up within the week. So give it a few days, but we'll get it up on there. And uh, yeah, we also will have information about future talks and you can also view some of our past talks on there as well. Um, and I also want to say that uh, we, our next webinar is, is scheduled for May 17th, and we're going to have with us Bashira Chowdhury, uh, who is a pollination ecologist with the Bee Biodiversity Initiative in Auburn's College of Agriculture, and she will be presenting on the topic of, uh, of her investigations into the pollination ecology of trilliums. As I understand, she's uh, currently out doing some of that research right now. So should be really fun to have her. And as always, uh, thanks everyone for coming out tonight and, and being here and, and all the great questions. And of course, Dr. Hayduke, we really appreciate you coming on and, and taking time out of your life to, to present on this topic. It was wonderful. Of course, um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions or suggestions, uh, Feel free to direct those to me at isabo at atlantabg.org. And as always, y'all are more than welcome to follow us on Instagram at Atlanta BG Conservation. And again, thanks everybody so much. Have a good evening. <laughs>